Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Torrin Schaefer. I'll be facilitating this book club, um, Practical Deep Learning for Programmers. Um, I have, this is my, I would say, third book club, second time facilitating. And I'm a statistics professor at Texas A&M University. Um, I am an R programmer not Python, but I had to teach Python last semester. Um, yeah, and so I'm excited to read this book to learn about um, the tools, I would say, in Python and like exactly what the book says, the practical side of it um, to communicate with students um, when they ask me how to fit these things. <laughs> All right, so I think we can go around and do, everyone can introduce themselves. Um, specifically, if you can tell me if you've done a book club with this group before, so I'll know how much detail we need to talk about logistics. Um, we can just do, I'll just call on someone next. Uh, John, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, John Ellis, I'm a data scientist working with transportation data. I'm also an adjunct professor, mostly, uh, with business analytics or data analytics and usually Python based. This is my second book club. I'm currently in a couple weeks into the advanced R book with uh, that started cohort nine. Okay. Um, Did you want me to pick somebody? Yeah, please. Aaron. Hey everybody, uh, Aaron here. I'm an actuary. I'm from Chicago, and uh, my day-to-day -day programming is in R, uh, both both uh, professionally and personally. Although I do have some experience with Python, uh, I bring up my first book club, which is model explanatory analysis. I'm in, also in a couple other ones concurrently, uh, including the, the Mastering Shiny and the Advanced R. Um, I have thumbed through some of the fast AI, fast AI videos for years now through like, <laughs> probably three different iterations, but never actually thoroughly uh, went through everything and, and definitely didn't complete uh, any of the uh, iterations. But um, I'm hoping this book club kind of <laughs> keeps me um, disciplined and I'll finally get through all of the, the code finally after, I don't know, four or five years of half-hearted attempts. All right, uh, I guess that means uh, it's my turn to pass the hat. I'm gonna go with Andrew. Hi everyone, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm a professor of economics. I'm based in Philippines and uh, this is my th third book club. Um, and I think I did, I started Python a, a month ago, learning it, uh, but for the purpose of teaching uh, a bit of uh, calculus with um, with Python, something something to that effect. So it's more of symbolic Python than the type of Python that you see in the in the book. Yeah. So looking forward to learn from everyone. Uh, the next person, uh, Kevin. Hey. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name's Kevin. I'm. I live in the Boston area. Uh, I've done a few book clubs uh, over the years. I facilitated Advanced R a long time ago. Um, and then I did a few more, one with Ron recently, uh, or somewhat recently, I guess, in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm a data scientist. Uh, working, I work in uh, tech, uh, like I'm a, on a team, basically like a DevOps team. So data about servers and infrastructure and stuff like that. Um, and I've read parts of this book before and I just didn't get all the way through it. I had a book club with some colleagues and we didn't finish it. And I just like really like his tone and educational approach. So um so I was excited to start again um and learn with you guys, with you all. So um who hasn't gone? It's just Ron or just me, I think. <laughs> all right. Well that <laughs> works. Mistaken. How's it going, Kevin? I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> 
Yeah, so um, I've done several of these book clubs, like Kevin said. We did, I, I can't even remember which ones we did now. Did we do Advanced Star? We did Regression Other Stories, maybe, or was it Bayesian book? I don't know. I've done many of them. <laughs> Most recently was the uh, Julia uh, book club with Torin and Andrew. So that was a lot of fun. Um, professionally, nowadays, I'm doing consulting primarily on, I guess you call it data science, but it's more like data analysis, model building, a lot of causal uh, modeling type things are as I sometimes call it casual, casual, casual. No, anyway, <laughs> uh, before that I was working for MIT Lincoln laboratory for a couple, a decade and a half or so doing, uh, I guess doing a lot of model building for them too. We called it systems analysis back then, but, uh, <laughs> it's all the same things. So I have quite a bit of experience with Python. Python is still my day to day. I use R sometimes, mostly when I'm trying to do stuff with Stan, um, because that's the easiest way to work with Stan these days. But I've been doing some things with uh, Command Stan Pi, but anyway, um, Python is the one I'm most comfortable with still. Uh, so that part's not so much of a challenge. I've done some deep learning with TensorFlow, but not so much with PyTorch, just a little bit. So um, I'm really interested in kind of refreshing my knowledge. I haven't done a lot of uh, machine learning, I shouldn't say machine learning, but I haven't done much um, uh, deep learning, neural net type architecture things for about a year or so. So um, look forward to refreshing that and learning new things. So that's that's about it. I think it's back to you, Torn. Oh, we have one more. I think, uh, I'm oh, the that, last one. Okay. How did I uh, misapprehend you after I learned how to pronounce your name and everything? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought I thought nobody chose me because uh, most of people <laughs> doesn't know how to pronounce your name, but that's no problem. You I pronounce apologize. it right. I really is is the right way. So please to meet you, everybody. And uh, I'm a pro, and uh, I'm I'm based in Brazil and Sao Paulo. And uh, I, I, I'm uh, more used with pair programming in my daily work. Uh, and I have a little experience with uh, Python, but I, I, I just find out that I'm, I'm extremely uh, really this material that uh, I started the book. So uh, it's gonna be an adventure to, to remember how to use Python to, to do all this work. So uh, uh, please to meet you and have to be. I'm sorry, did you say, have you done a book club with this group before? Oh, sorry, it's my first book club. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I'm the facilitator, which just means I make sure that someone speaks every week. And if they don't show up, then I will take over. <laughs> um, but yeah, so each week we have, hopefully among us, one volunteer to present notes on the chapter uh, for the book and you can sign up here at this link um it will start to get oh it looks like we already have people awesome and i see here i was thinking for Jan july 3rd we might skip um, for the 4th of July holiday in the U.S. Um, that's that's okay. why I didn't sign up for that because I don't know that I'm going to... Well, I'll be here, but I just won't be available the week before that to do, even think about this. So. Yeah. <laughs> try. So I appreciate we have so many people signed up. That's great. <laughs> um, so I will adjust the calendar to skip that week. And yeah. And um, the slides, if you choose can be added for future cohorts to this github repo um i, I would say it's not a requirement but it does help future <laughs> cohorts um i don't think we did it all the time for the julia one but that's okay i don't think that one will get read again honestly no and part of the problem <laughs> is too that our markdown and julia don't necessarily play that well together so you kind of had to do like multiple yeah things so and i think that might also be the kind of the case here since all it's all python a lot of it's gonna be notebooks on Kaggle or something so i don't know yeah we'll see um yeah, we'll see. i didn't have any code today so we'll see i think that's essentially the logistics um these are recorded and if you know each week we can put the start and stop um to help clip the public videos 
for the YouTube channel. Um, I think that's the main logistics. All right. Okay. So let's get started. Share my screen. So as I mentioned in the chat, I didn't actually read the book. I only watched the video. So we are going through this course, um, I would say, I guess, asynchronously. There's a video for each lesson and I'll talk about it a little bit. Some of you said you already started it, so you probably already know. So getting started. So the objectives of this first video is basically what do we need to get started? There's a motivating example. And then I would say a lot of the second half of the discussion is sort of big picture. What is deep learning and how does fast AI fit into deep learning um, use? Okay. So the tools. So everything it will be in Python. There will be some. So the main Python library is fast AI. That's people running the course. This fast AI library is built on top of PyTorch to be more user-friendly. Um, they gave an example in the video just showing the difference in the condensation of code when you go from PyTorch to fast AI. Um, all of the book is written in Jupyter, so you can read the book for free in Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub. And they also have on Kaggle companion notebooks um, and you can run these things on the cloud can't remember why I put that anyway and here's some rec a recommended book from I already forgot the guy's name James uh, Jeremy say that again Jeremy yes <laughs> he uh, recommends this book meta learning and then, of course, the book that the videos are made off of, Deep Learning for Coders. And he specifically mentioned that if you watch the video, you could still gain something by reading the book chapters because it's uh, part of his teaching philosophies to present things in multiple different ways. Okay. So I like this. This is um, the prerequisite. So first of all, the course doesn't teach. Python, um, although there are certainly tons of notebooks. So if you already know how to program in one language, you can probably easily um, read the notebooks. And so here is the myth about deep learning that you need to know lots of math. Um, in reality, high school math is sufficient. Basically, if you know what a derivative is, I think you can get very, very far <laughs> in deep learning. Um, lots of data is he claims is a myth. I'm a little bit skeptical of this one. Um, I think it depends on quality and what the task is, but um, he says they've had record-breaking results um, with less than 50 pieces of data. So maybe 50 images, uh, 50 people, et cetera. Myth, lots of expensive computers. Um, and then he demonstrates in the video, you can get state of the art work basically for free. And one of the big um, reasons why is you can use pre-trained models for a lot of tasks. Okay. So the motivating example was this, is it a bird system? Okay, so some takeaways from this example, I didn't, we can open up the Kaggle um, notebook in a second, but just a reminder that images are numbers, right? They're, a matrix at least, or there might be an array of matrices if you have other images, right? Every pixel in the image um, has some numbers that give it the color or the grayscale. Then he gave some examples of what else we can turn into an image. So sounds, you can have the um, sound, I believe it was in the frequency domain transformation. You can turn a time series into an image and then there was an example of trajectory data. So like the path uh, that, well, this was a path of a, someone's mouse. So if you track my mouse, you can have 
um, different colors corresponding to different intensities of how often I go to certain positions. Okay. They introduce, why don't I just open this tackle? Introduces this workflow for getting images from DuckDuckGo, which Ron put in the chat um, a change to. This is not what I want. This is it a bird? Okay, so this is just a copy of the is it a bird notebook, and there was a comment in Slack. To use the DuckDuckGo, there is a change from when this course was released about over a year ago. Okay. All right. And then one of the main tools in the FastAI library is this data block function. And the data block function sort of tells the um, model building part, what kind of inputs do you have and what kind of outputs that you have and the, a couple of more things in between. And then he runs a CNN live, that's what this notebook does, on 400 images, it took, it was a matter of seconds, okay. Okay, so where is deep learning in context of this course, which was in July, 2022? So we've seen a lot of these, right, GPT. So Dolly is another, uh, one of these um, large language models that takes text and turns it into images. There's another type of um, software, Midjourney, that does the same thing. Um, he talks about deep learning and, and art sort of in two ways. You have a programmer who is not an artist using deep learning to make art, but you also have artists um, making art, um, more complicated art, I guess. Then, yeah, Google Pathways language model, is a um, tool that you ask it a question and it will give, not just give you an answer, but it will explain how it got that answer. And then um, as you probably <laughs> have had discussions about AI with your colleagues, your friends, your families, um, we wanna think about ethics. So there is a whole other course on the Fast AI website just for ethics. So maybe that would be like a good um, continuation of this book club. All right. So deep learning, the sort of broad way we can think about it is think about going from a regression model to a neural network. One of the differences is with the neural network, we don't hand code the features, meaning we don't tell the regression model, my inputs are time, time squared, space, um, temperature. We say, I've measured these things, and then the neural network um, learns transformation of those inputs uh, through, and it learns what transformations work well um, through the examples that you give it. Deep learning then composes these features, and so you can learn different scales. There were a bunch of images going from showing, opening up a deep neural network, looking at the um, features at each level where, and when it got closer to the output, it was picking up maybe, I, I would say more localized or specialized features. So for the images, there were things like going from a corner to like an eye of an animal. Um, so again, if, if you watch, go back and watch that video. Okay, so we're going to be using Jupiter, okay? And the cloud, Jupiter, um, right, is part of this literate programming where we're interweaving code cells and markdown cells. There are different ways you can run Jupyter Notebooks. Um, there's Google Colab. This course uses Kaggle. Um, and then just if you are a Python programmer, this might be of 
meaning to you <laughs> well the jeremy mentioned that his python programming is more of a functional style i guess that's maybe opposed to um i'm not sure what it, it he was mentioning it specifically when he was using maps so i don't know if that's be, instead of like doing for loops um but this is his claim if, if anyone has any comments on what that means in python feel free I, I don't have a comment on on that last point, but I, I do about kind of the the setup for this course. I, I know like it's really easy to run this stuff through Kaggle, which is great, and that's kind of how I work through some things. But I, I have also set this up through Anaconda on a Windows machine. Um, I don't know if other folks have done this as well, but there are some wrinkles in doing so. If you kind of want to go down that route and you have a GPU, um, I've noticed that things really don't speed up with my GPU if I install. Um, fast AI through through Anaconda. Um, but what Jeremy recommends is using WSL, so Windows Subsystem for Linux, um, to get started. And, and I've done that as well. And uh, things run much faster. So if you are a Windows user, you have access to a GPU on your local machine. I just wanted to point out that like go the go the WSL route because you're gonna you're gonna have a much better experience. Yeah, I 100% um, agree with that. And I, mean, I think it's almost impossible to get it working without using w, on Windows without using WSL. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And what's really cool is um, Jeremy has like a bunch of these live coding sessions. I'm going to put the link in here, uh, these oh. live coding sessions. And the first video is really going through how to set up WSL um, if you're interested. Yeah, thanks so much. I certainly don't recommend um, doing that unless you really want to, though. I mean, that, in the course is the same thing. Like, don't don't do that. <laughs> don't, you know, but if you do, if you want to, if you really want to learn something about that, to do it. But otherwise, you're better off using the notebooks. Yeah, maybe fix your second. Yeah, time I mean, you through. can waste a lot of time just with with the with the setup. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just uh, in the past, just playing around with just the the basic Windows setup. You know, it was many hours of my time, never really getting it to a good place. John asked, "Well." Django. Yeah, I wasn't sure if oh, uh, yes. everyone was familiar about the importance oh. of using virtual environments oh, yeah. in Absolutely. Python and understanding how to set those up or what those are. Because um, from personal experience, multiple times, I have completely destroyed my Python build by not using virtual environments. Plus, it only uses what you need to within it. Go ahead, Abreu. Well, it, it was just ER. Does anybody have problems with uh, using the Kaggle? And when I try to import the packets, uh, Kaggle complains about the version. If you try to keep the old version, uh, it complains about the, the packets that are installed. Uh, if, you, you ask for, if you ask for update the, the packets for the last version, version it also, uh, it, it, for me, it uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I had to, in, to manually install some packets in Python to, to make it work. Hmm. I think I'm you have to make sure. sure you unpin the environment for the Kaggle notebook. That might be what the issue is. I'm not sure. But... Yeah. If you go to Ron's um, thing in Slack, this is the only notebook I ran in Kaggle, and I got it to work eventually after I um, had some account issues. But here, if you follow these three steps, so, oh, sorry, I got in a different, where am I? I'm lost. Safari, okay. So the first one is under your, after you um, make a copy, you go in the session options and you have this environment. So yeah, you'll wanna change this to always use latest environment. Um, once you have a cell phone number verified on your account, you can turn on the internet. And then the third thing is to change this code, code cell. Yeah, yeah, I, I find out that the, 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 the Go search wasn't working. I updates very similar to what you did. And but even uh, even even uh, doing the face recognition and everything like that, mm -hmm. whenever I run the code from the English block, when he tries to pip install things, 
it complains mm -hmm. about uh, uh, he says that the fast AI fast AI version is not compatible with the last version of other packets. So mm -hmm. back packets version it's a uh, uh, an issue in every environment. Mm -hmm. But uh, af after uh, just uh, specifically uh, specifying the, the version of some packets, it works for me. But it, mm. it, it wasn't Kaggle, so it, it didn't run smoothly as I expected. Anyway, uh, I could do it, but uh, it took me some time to find the, the correct version of some packets. Yeah. And another thing that uh, I don't know if you uh, realize is that uh, I got a little confused when he was explaining uh, the data block uh, structure. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that the data block structure is used to, uh, to send mm -hmm. the data to algorithm. So yeah. that's clear. But uh, in the next block, uh, he starts fine turning before fitting the model. And in the video, he says something because the model is a red fit in the library that he's using. So it is, I, I really couldn't understand exactly, exactly there if you go back. Uh, so okay. this is a data block. Okay, so it's clear, it's preparing the data to send to the algorithm. And then uh, in the next one, you see there that he creates the learner. And instead of fitting the model, this directly goes to fine tuning, the yes. second line. I, and and he explained he's... that in the video, saying that the, the models are at fit. And yes. uh, that seems a little bit the word to me. OK, yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. Um, so yeah, so as you mentioned, the data block, this is how we get data to the model. And this is, in his opinion, is the most important data science task. And I think I agree, right? It's really important for you as a user or modeler to know what your inputs and outputs are. And then from there, you can figure out what models work with those inputs and outputs. Um, most existing model and you don't have to spend that much time then thinking about the architecture right so how deep is the model how many nodes are the model what kind of activation functions are you going to have etc uh, because most existing model architectures have been shown to work well across systems systems meaning like different domains medical biology um, econ etc so the main arguments of this data block as I mentioned, what is your input? Is it an image? Is it a vector? Is it uh, a matrix? What is it? What type of output? Is it a scalar, a vector, another image, text? Um, where is the training data? Is it on your computer? Is it on the cloud? Uh, so where does it download the training data? How should the data be split? Uh, and this was interesting. So this data block function will not run unless you set up a validation set. Um, so they have embedded their, um, I don't want to say beliefs, but <laughs> embedded their standards uh, in this function that you need to have a validation set. set. Um, where is the training output? So again, where is it? And how should the training items be transformed? Uh, do you want to normalize, etc.? Then you use this learner function to pair the data with a model type. This is an intermediate flexible approach. And it, then there are um, specialized functions for common data structure. So data block is the flexible one. And then the, he shows some examples of more specific ones like, OK, you have images to classification of a label. There is a specific function um, that skips some of these options. OK, so let's talk about, I think this is sort of your question, Abreu. So pre-trained models. Um, this is one reason why fast AI is fast. Pre-trained means you don't start with a random network that then needs to be uh, optimized, right? You need to do gradient descent and 
keep iterating until you reach some stopping point, but you instead start with weight from a model that was previously trained on a different data set. Okay. And then you tune it on your data set. So the thought is that, so for images, for example, um, ResNet, I believe, yes, for images, it was trained on tons and tons and tons of images to get different features. Um, so the thought is that some of the uh, features that learned will still be useful in your situation, like corners, edges, boundaries, um, but then you can tune it to get more specialized on the data you're using. Okay. Um, this is more useful in image models, he mentions. Um, I'm guessing that's just because of computation and uh, I mean, the specialty. <laughs> It's used in almost everything nowadays. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. the, uh, it's the P in GPT. Yeah, <laughs> Down that's true. Train. Yeah, I guess that's for <laughs> language models, yeah. yeah. I guess, I think actually what he meant is it's more useful if you think your computation is going to take a while, where some of these regression, more like oh, regression yeah. problems are faster. Like tabular data. Yeah. Yeah. Really bad. yeah. Does that help with your question, Abreu? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Please go yeah. on. Okay. All right. So, types of problems where deep learning is state of the art. Um, we have computer vision, segmentation, where we are essentially doing like spatial clustering. So you're going to combine pixels that are nearby and say they belong to one item object label. Tabular analysis, which is like our classic regression. Um, collaborative filtering, which is a recommendation system. That one, I'll be honest, I understand probably the least. <laughs> um, natural language processing, robotics, playing games like Atari and Go. And then uh, medicine and biology applications. So um, cells, like images of tissues of, um, into classification or has been, yeah, pretty, I think, profound results in medicine for diagnosing patients. Um, I will, have not read any of these papers, so I'm just going off what he said in the video. <laughs> All right. Um, and sort of why and or slash when does deep learning win? And so it's tasks where a human or even an ex an expert human like a doctor, maybe I can't diagnose someone from a radiograph, but a doctor can quickly. Um, those are tasks that deep learning probably will do well. Um, it probably will not do well if it's a long logical thought process with sparse data, like a historical debate, or so, I think he talks about politics a lot in the, for this example, like who's going to be the next president. It's not actually like a lot of data on that, and it's more about debating and social cues and things that you can't measure very well. Um, all right, a trained model, then he goes through these series of DAGs where a trained model is just something that maps inputs to results, just like any other computer program. Um, but getting to the end takes some tricks and that's where we have our um, gradient descent, auto differentiation and things like that. All right. Um, and then I just put this in here. This was the, if they, if you were in the course live, this was your homework, I did not do this um, re read the book chapter, but I did run this, um, notebook, everything worked well. So that's all I have for chapter one. Are there any other comments about it? And stop sharing. Uh, yeah, just to comment that, you know, if you are an R user, <laughs> and don't want to deviate from that, there is a fast AI um, wrapper uh, that you can use. I haven't played with it, but um, I'll paste that in here. 
if you're interested. And then I, I don't know if anybody actually kind of went through the the first week as, assignment, you know, the the bird versus the forest, and did their own version of that. Um, I I did. <laughs> I was trying to see if I could use two categories that are pretty similar to each other to not get a good accuracy and kind of got there. I mean, I, I got like an 80% uh, comparing two different guitar types. Um, I don't know if it's, anyone's interested in looking at this uh, yeah. quickly. Yeah. So we have a little you want to share? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I like the um, adversarial approach. Yeah. Especially <laughs> yeah, trying to, trying to break it a little bit. I doubt that ResNet had a lot of guitars in its like feature set when they trained it, right? <laughs> Probably, maybe not. I don't know. It seems unlikely. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I play a few musical instruments, and I, I the, the two guitar types that I'm looking at are a Jaguar, which is the one on the top here. I own one of these, and um, Jazz Master. And um, try to zoom out so you can see both of them. They have basically the same body <laughs> so it's a little little tricky it's not like if you know anything about guitars there's like a les paul which looks very different than both these guitars but these guitars are very similar uh in, in terms of they have an offset body design um they're both manufactured by fender uh there are some differences though in terms of like you know the switches are a little different you see one switch up here for the the jazz master and there are multiple whoops uh switches for the for the jaguar and the the pickups are a little bit different in general like the jazz master has these thick pickups and uh the uh, jaguar has thinner ones and so i thought this would be you know kind of a tricky one for um for uh for the the, the fast ai algorithm here using the cnn and here are just some other e examples here um I didn't really try to tweak this thing. It was really paint by numbers. I just kind of up the, the the epochs instead of doing the the three or four or whatever that was the default. I, I ran it up to ten, and so I got eighty percent accuracy or roughly a you know twenty percent error rate, which is not bad by, by any means, um, but uh, certainly not as good as the uh, the example that Jeremy was showing, where you have a bird and a forest, and I feel like that's that's kind of low hanging fruit. <laughs> compared it's, to something like this. It's interesting because I think I couldn't do much better than 80% either because some of those pictures are only little pieces, uh, like the neck. That's right. Whatever. You probably could, Aaron, but I, for me, <laughs> I probably couldn't do that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, if I you're just showing me, the yeah. body, yeah. you might not be able to tell. Right, yeah. exactly. Another interesting thing about this, though, is like with these guitars on the headstock, you know, there's a description of, of what the model is. Like it will say Jaguar or Jazzmaster on that. So I'm assuming, you know, the convolutional neural net is picking up on that to some degree too. It can actually read, <laughs> this says Jaguar, therefore it's a Jaguar, or this says it's a Jazz Master, therefore it's a Jazz Master. Interesting. That's all I have. No. Yeah, cool. No, I um, didn't try that, but I do have a computer vision task that is hard. Um, it's like they put cameras in the forest to take pictures of snakes and they just want to know if there's a snake in the image or not then yeah it's not as easy i could see that being pretty <laughs> difficult yeah for sure i mean a snake i would imagine yeah. would blend into the background well the snakes yeah. have evolved to do that so <laughs> it's yeah. like you're, you're really fighting a tough problem there for, for the most part right <laughs> yeah i mean i have trouble it's... people walking in the forest have trouble that's why they end up like running into them all the time I thought it was <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, are there any other comments on chapter one? There's uh, just one thing. I, I only watched part of the video. I had a busy week, so I plan to go back to the chapter uh, later. But um, the, the comment about state of the art around tabular data is interesting. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say the opposite that, like, you can't do much better than like XG boosts in like most cases and deep learning doesn't doesn't usually outperform it especially for like the the parsimony of the approaches um if you think about that so 
I don't know. Mm. I it, that's just like a thing that I've heard a lot of people say. I don't um, think that the book was saying that deep learning was a good, a real good approach for this, right? Uh, mm. the, in fact, the section on tabular data uses XGBoost. Um, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, in fact, it kind of, okay. the, the moral of that thing was that sometimes deep learning is not the best thing. I, I mean, you can develop like TabNet. There's a few others out there yeah. really working hard on on doing tabular data with uh, deep learning, mainly because they want to combine it with other things that aren't tabular, right? But right. they can reach the same level as XGBoost, but they're a lot slower to train, <laughs> a yeah, lot yeah. slower to run even. So there's no reason to use it if you just have tab tabular data. Right, right. Okay, okay. So then that isn't as confusing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, for me, yeah, I, I don't know about other folks here, but like my my day to day is mostly tabular data, and that's probably same. why my my deep learning experience has has lagged a little bit, just because I I don't have that opportunity, you know, on a regular basis to to uh, apply this stuff. Yeah. For me, I I just I didn't do the video. I read the book instead. And uh, I think there are a lot more examples available. Uh, and the data, it's a, the, the code is a little bit different. Although the structure of what, or at least the syntax or what to ex what, what to put in as input is roughly the same. So you, you get to see uh, there's a tabular data example. There's a text analysis kind of example in the book as well. Uh, I, I, I made the mainly played around with the with the movie review uh, example mm. and uh, yeah and then try, filtering yeah and then I, I tried to do the uh, well put in reviews from Rotten Tomatoes from some critic and then tried you know seeing if it works very well and uh, uh, I tried one with uh, a review from uh, about Beverly Hills Cop two. And it was supposed to be a negative review, and uh, it came out like a positive one. <laughs> <laughs> so you could try, you, you could have fun with that. Oh, cool! Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually interested in fitting some. Oh, on my PhD course is like we you know, went in the weeds and like, I programmed some of these like from scratch, I'm um, like very toy, but like actually like, just how do people use them? I feel like I didn't get to that part. <laughs> cool, all right. Well, there another comments? Let's send early and we have um, I already forgot. Kevin volunteered for next week. All right. Great. Have a good week, everyone. Yeah, Take care. Have a good week. Nice to see you, see you all. later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.